Welcome to today's program, and thank you for joining us. I'm C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President, and currently the President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, Inc. The mission of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, also known as NBLACA, is to educate, mobilize, and empower black leaders to meet the challenge of fighting HIV AIDS and other health disparities in their local communities. So today, we will be addressing the needs of the Haitian community with regard to HIV and other health needs, both in New York City and in Haiti. The Caribbean nation was devastated by Hurricane Matthew in October 2016 with over 1,000 lives lost and an outbreak of cholera in the aftermath. Meanwhile, here in New York City, Haitians are among the immigrant populations requiring health services, including those relating to HIV. Here to discuss the need at home and abroad are Kareen Jocelyn, CEO of Diaspora Community Services serving Brooklyn, and Marie Martha St. Cia, Executive Director of the Lambie Fund of Haiti. Welcome and thank both of you for joining us. It's um, been a relationship of many years I've had with both of you. And Marie, I haven't seen you in many years, but I had a chance to see uh, Jocelyn as we passed in the airports last year, I was on my way to Haiti. She was on her way back from Haiti because she had spent a whole year there uh, to further her commitment to addressing the needs of uh, people living in Haiti. And as a Haitian American, I really did applaud that and I, I thank you for that commitment. Thank so you. because I haven't seen you for a while, Marie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your organization, Lambi Fund of Haiti, in terms of what you're doing and certainly the health related issues. Well, having worked in the city, as you know, my, I really, I'm doing my last leg of work in my country. It, is, it's, it was my hope and my engagement and commitment to the Haitian people. The Lambie Fund of Haiti is an organization that is for the last 22 years, partnering with rural farmers in Haiti in order to really move into sustainability of agriculture, greater education um, on agricultural needs and skills development. In addition with the threat of prioritizing women uh, in terms of developing their enterprise and being uh, farmers that are supported and a component on gender equity. And so uh, we work with farmers across, across Haiti uh, addressing things like potable water, sustainable irrigation, um, uh, cistern development, um, microcredit for women, loans to planters who need to develop more acreage and plant more food. We are at the center of food security and uh, management uh, of a small business, both for women and for farmers. We are in collaboration for advocate for increased uh, resources for the farming community and uh, realizing that back in 1950s, in the 50s, Haiti sustained its, nine, its millions of people in terms of food, and we've regressed and we need to go forward with sustainable agriculture. And now that's very interesting because you talk about uh, partnering with rural farmers in Haiti. And while I've seen less of the rural areas, I've certainly seen the urban areas. And unfortunately, uh, the devastation that still exists uh, there after the earthquake and now, of course, the hurricane. So I can only imagine what life is like in the rural areas. Well, post Hurricane Matthews, mm -hmm. it has the 145 miles per hour wind has flattened. A lot of work that has done to make the south of Haiti much greener and much more productive mm -hmm. with food. And so essentially, if you want to feed those 9 million Haitians, we need to really support and undergird the development of agriculture back 
into production of food and food that is affordable. Because right now Haiti is riveting from not only the earthquake, but now the storm. And uh, the loss of food, the loss of uh, storage grain, the loss of capacity to seed is a critical element in assuring that there is no fam famine when the relief agencies leave. And of course, even going there with the work that you're doing now, partnering with farmers in Haiti, you also carry with you the background of health, working in the field of HIV and working with women. So I'd like to ask you, uh, as far as your organization, Kareen, tell us a little bit about the work mm -hmm. of the diaspora community, as especially at a time when there's a lot of emphasis on immigrants, immigration, but working with an immigrant population, especially women, mm -hmm. and issues related to HIV. Sometimes in the larger discussion of immigration, these kind of specific issues and needs get overlooked, but mm -hmm. I know in the daily work that you do, it's not possible to overlook it. So sure. why don't you tell us a little <laughs> about your organization? Sure, well, the Diaspora Community Services was originally founded actually by the Haitian community and Haitian women who saw a great need in the community and they felt that there were unmet needs that they wanted to address. And so um, a group of strong women, as I'm surrounded by, um, came together and said, what do we need? And really they saw healthcare access as being the primary need for the community. And today as Diaspora Community Services, we continue to see that as a primary need. And so you can imagine that they started in um, the late 80s and in the early 90s really committed the organization to working around issues of um, HIV prevention, education, um, and we still continue to do that. Um, the priority populations may have changed, but for us it's always been communities of color, um, it's always been young people, it certainly has been immigrants, um, folks of um, limited literacy. Um, sometimes we have immigrants who are not even literate in their own native language. And so being able to adjust or adapt messages of prevention and education for them um, is extremely important. I think the issue around um, HIV and immigrants, and particularly, I think, specifically with the Haitian community, as you know, um, I guess early 90s, um, Haitians were very much stigmatized, Absolutely. right, as the carrier of HIV. And while that may be 20 years ago, there certainly is a long-term effect that happens. And while most recently, um, a study was done to say um, this was not the population that brought um, HIV and AIDS to the world, and, but the damage has already been done. Mm -hmm. And so I think the effect of that, unfortunately, is kind of regressing in terms of the community of not wanting to talk about it because they don't want to be seen as, you know, this, mm -hmm. this was, maybe this was true or wasn't it true. So I think that still, that still remains. I think in the broader picture of um, immigrants and HIV, it is still the issue of stigma. It's still the issue of um, discrimination. Um, at Diaspora, we have a program, the Medical Benefits Assistance Program, which specifically targets um, folks who are HIV positive, who are immigrants, and who are undocumented immigrants. Because now we say that again, it's the... The Medical Benefits Assistance Program. Okay. It's federally funded dollars that right. comes through the State Department mm -hmm. of Health AIDS Institute. Um, and the focus and the priority population is for folks who are HIV positive, immigrants who are undocumented, who feel that, who are HIV positive, who are afraid to come forward. We don't want them living with HIV and AIDS and getting sicker and sicker and sicker. We have this program, the ADAP program, which is a federal program, the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which really allows these folks, people to come forward, receive confidential quality care and access to health insurance, which is extremely important, particularly now with potential changes in the Affordable Care Act, um, to ensure that immigrants, no matter their HIV status, have access to some form of health care. And I think that, you know, in the aftermath of the recent um, presidential election, and of course none of us know where all of this is going to lead, some mm -hmm. policies are going to be put in place. Sure. But as we look at the immigrant population and the focus that has been given to it and so many questions around what will those policies in fact look like, mm -hmm. 
the thought of undocumented immigrants uh, living with HIV AIDS and afraid to come forth now, I think we're going to probably see a doubling down in terms of people not wanting to come forward. And that makes the work a little bit harder, it right? Will, it will certainly be a little bit harder. And for us internally, it's about having the conversation and making sure that um, as we have a new administration mm -hmm. um, in Washington, ensuring that HIV is still part of the conversation, not just only in the New York area, but certainly globally. Um, because I always say, you know, immigrants don't just stay in New York. They do travel. <laughs> um, they do have relationships and families and children and so forth. And so I think it's more of, it's not a local issue. It certainly is a national issue and of course a global issue. So what's being done to address HIV AIDS in Haiti now? Uh, Marie, you have any sense of... Uh, in Haiti, clearly. Health outcomes for women is critical. We have such high level of poverty and high level of unemployment that the risk that we talked about in terms of privatization of women is a critical one. And no matter where you turn, the risk uh, for STDs, HIV, mm -hmm. is an increase when you have such high unemployment among women, such high um, uh, uh, inability to basically take care of yourself. The dependency on, on sex exchange for money is clearly there. And the indicators of uh, in Haiti is continuously to show increased HIV among youth, increased HIV among poor women, and it is a concern across, across the, blo the globe. And it will continue to be a concern as long as we have the health outcome and studies that we have in Haiti currently. And given the number, and this is something I hear a lot about, and I think I heard a number like 2,000 or so uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, working in Haiti or some astronomical number. Yeah, we hear 10,000. It was like 7,000, 8,000. <laughs> but you know a lot of them. Right? Yeah. We, we know that, that there, there are too, are too many. many. <laughs> we know there that there are too, are too many. many. Yes. So what is the mechanism or process by bringing groups together, collaborating, coordinating efforts so that the people in Haiti can receive maximum uh, outcomes through these collaborated and coordinated efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, it is unfortunate that the NGO world has grown so tremendously in Haiti, mm -hmm. especially post-disasters. And their focus has been really maintaining uh, NGO, the NGO capacity rather than maintaining Haitian capacity. Because if they were maintaining Haitian capacities, we would see a reduction of the number of NGOs. Unfortunately, it's increasing, and it's creating a new elite in Haiti that is so much supported by their own resources, and it challenges the, the emergence of leadership as well as the emergence of skills that are needed to support the 9 million Haitians. And so the policy around NGO is in what way uh, it doesn't really serve the Haitian population because we don't see the trickle-down effect and we certainly don't see the service and outcomes that we would want, whether we look at health or sustainability. The reality is that we are actually generating resources to maintain a new class of people in Haiti. That has to change. Mm -hmm. So who comprised these new elites? I've read a lot about Haiti and had a sense of that. The elites, the who's mm -hmm. comprising people who are being serviced through the NGOs and sort of rising above the poverty level. Who's in this new elite class that you speak about, Marie? Uh, we're talking about a lot of expatriates who ah. come to Haiti to live, thousands of them mm -hmm. who live, who serve the country, young, uh, making a new career of Haiti and mm -hmm. becoming expert overnight. It's not that Haiti doesn't need additional support, but we need to have support that bridges into the community, that transfers skills to the community, and that continue to have community-focused goals. Mm -hmm. When I look at Haiti, I don't see the integration of the people of Haiti in the work that is being done. Mm -hmm. And that is cle uh, clearly a critical element in our good and development. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important in all communities. We certainly do 
uh, adhere to those principles here in terms of the integration and the engagement of people in the communities. Yes. They need ownership right. about Absolutely. whatever is happening to mm -hmm. participate in making decisions uh, about uh, services, mm -hmm. identifying needs, yes. and uh, being able to have a lot to say. So it shouldn't be any different in Haiti. You know, I think that we were we were both at a conference last week where several um, funders and providers um, of Haiti were, were were in attendance, and the ambassador of Haiti spoke. The U.S. ambassador spoke, and he said, "You know, we need to have a change in the narrative of Haiti." And that he put, I think, the onus on all of us in the room to say, mm -hmm. as funders, as those those that are recipients of of funds, the reality is that Haiti is a sovereign state. It is a a free state. Um, and so I believe that it's important that, and I think part of what Marie said is true, that we certainly need assistance, right? Every organ is, every country, I mean, even in the U.S., we have millions of nonprofit organizations that, that support um, various um, areas of need. And so we would certainly not say that that's not needed in Haiti, but there needs to be a system in place that can, one, absorb the number of NGOs that are in Haiti, have some sense of accountability, and transparency for the organizations so that if you're coming into the country, we need to be sure of what you're going to be doing there. And certainly work with the Haitian government as best as possible to be able to come and support whatever initiative or area that you may be interested in. I think that that's key. Otherwise, uh, efforts are not sustainable. Absolutely. It's just going to yes. do something, and so we need Absolutely. sustainability. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how much time are you spending in Haiti now, Marie, yourself? I spend, I spend quite a bit of time in terms of developing projects and learning from the rural farmers, uh, as well as working with them in identifying their needs. It is a true partnership in the way that we work. We call it a bottom-up model because the decisions to do X, Y, Z comes from the community groups. We work with organizations that bring farmers together mm -hmm. or that bring women together. Uh, and the decision is how do we support them? We look at feasibility of what they propose to do and we develop a contract on how to support them. And we don't go there for one year fiscal year, we're there for two, three years, and when we leave, we sust they are sustainable in terms of producing the revenue and supporting the, uh, uh, the activity that they are doing. Uh, Karine, do we have any data or information specific to the number, uh, the rates of HIV among Haitian here in the United States. I know sometimes surveillance and data is hard to get, yes. <laughs> even for other people. So. You know, I think what, what happens with, with data also is um, the self-identity, if you will, right, of, um, for myself, for example, you know, I consider myself to be um, Haitian or Haitian American, having been born in this country, and so that can kind of skew the data some way. But I think that if we, we look at data um, in terms of HIV transmission, um, we have always disproportionately in terms of communities of color, of women, of immigrants, um, and certainly in the MSM community now, men who have sex with men, um, the numbers continue to rise. Um, but even back in the 90s where, or, or at the beginning of HIV and AIDS, it was um, you know, the focus was on gay white men. But even at that time, the numbers were still disproportionate among communities of color, and particularly um, women of color. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was always there. And so I think for the Haitian community, they're a mix of all of what New York City is. They are, they are folks of color, um, they are immigrants, uh, many are dealing with issues related to poverty and, and access to care. And so I would say that they're, they're in the mix in terms of HIV surveillance numbers. So what I'm hearing from you ladies, and knowing something about your work, mm -hmm. that there is still much work to be done. Oh boy. Absolutely. And that despite <laughs> sure. good work yeah. and the continuing efforts that we all are making, uh, the work still continues and we've gotta make some breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the questions I'd ask both of you, with an incoming new administration, what might you hope for as it relates to the work that you're doing, certainly yours specifically on the ground in Haiti, and yours mm -hmm. in working with immigrant populations, mm -hmm. uh, health, mm -hmm. HIV, mm -hmm. and we know 
what has been happening. You know, we have the President Obama who set forth the first national HIV AIDS strategy that has Correct. given us uh, tremendous opportunities and guidelines about what needs to be done. So, Marie, to start with you, what are some of the things you might expect from a new administration along the lines in terms of needs that you know exist for Haiti? I think that the first priority, I would think, in a new administration, if I were to think of change in Haiti, we need policy that doesn't um, cater to developing resources but giving the resources to the local. So in Haiti, you see the majority of resources supposedly going toward Haiti, but they are contracted within the United States. And so the outcome is very poor in terms of what is transferred and what stays in Haiti. And the people in most need do not get it. So the perspective would be that the needs of Haiti would be uh, prioritized, but that comes along with the government and administration of Haiti also that prioritizes the needs of its people. That would be the overall, uh, to me, caveat that would change how resources are allocated and how resources are spent in Haiti. And Kareem? I think for me, um, it's the, the overall conversation around immigration in this country and that the new administration certainly, um, just as the Obama administration has a, a right and a duty to address immigration in this country um, without rhetoric. Um, we, we hear and we have heard certainly through this whole election process um, about de deportation. Um, we've heard about um, the portrayal of immigrants as um, criminals. And, and certainly for me, it's always the issue about looking at um, undocumented immigrants as all coming from Mexico. Um, and we're not having, I think, a fair conversation about undocumented immigrants in this country coming from everywhere. That they're not just Latinos, but they represent um, all countries from around the world. So I think the conversation about um, immigration and what we're going to do about that is key and important. Certainly, as you mentioned under the Obama administration, the national aid strategy, what can this admin the new administration take from that and enhance it so that they are on board, similar to the um, New York State governor speaking to ending the epidemic. We'd love to see on a national level that the new administration um, is signs off on or enhances this push of ending the AIDS epidemic in, in the United States. And I think because we live in a global world, we don't, we're just not here alone. Um, the importance of PEPFAR continuing. Yes. Um, President Bush, um, <coughs> Um, did that for us, and I think it's it's an amazing thing, and we want to see that continue. So I would say for the new administration, those areas, and I couldn't leave out the Affordable Care Act. I know people call it Obamacare all the time and the repealing of that. Um, I would hope that our president-elect would look at that and see what works and perhaps what doesn't work. Not everyone agrees with it 100%. And I know that uh, through some of these, in many of these efforts, there are national and international mm -hmm. organizations. Is there a national body uh, made up principally of Haitians mm -hmm. who are prepared to move policy to advance discussions and uh, put many of the agendas that you talked about, Marie, mm -hmm. policies, resources, meeting the needs of Haiti, and uh, as Kareen mentioned, continuing some of the policies like around the National Aid Strategy as well as PEPFAR to ensure that uh, the research, the technology and the gains made but still needing to continue around HIV because we don't have a vaccine. Is there a national body of Haitians who are really organized and addressing I because think it's that hard for us individually to get our messages yes. through. Sure. I think there are some emerging groups, mm -hmm. but I don't think they have galvanized as a concrete movement of advocacy and prioritizing the needs of Haitian mm -hmm. people with Haitian backing. I think they are emerging groups. Sure. And so I think that they continue the dialogue. I don't think they are at the point of just basically um, inserting into discussion with the continuous presence. And I think that's where the Haitian community will come to play, where we would galvanize as communities to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think um, if there is ever more time for that, it is now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would agree. I think that there are many um, Haitian organizations that have 
um, over the years always sustained Haiti. Um, there's always been family members, right, who sustain um, families, and that's, that's always been key and important. There are many great organizations doing some great work. Um, there's a National Association of Haitian Advancing Haitian Professionals. I may yes. be saying that wrong. Yes. Um, there's certainly the Haitian Roundtable um, led here in New York. But I would say that, you know, Haitians make up or Haitian Americans make up the fabric of this country and are um, reflected across many sectors uh, from healthcare to law and policy. And so this is th the opportunity for them to um, move forward and really come together to be able to address some of these issues as one. Agreed. Well, ladies, let me say, I have certainly learned a lot and I am uh, very interested in being supportive efforts in Haiti and here in uh, this country uh, to make sure that uh, a lot of what you've said are addressed and that we are able to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I would say to our uh, viewers that in order to learn more about the work of Diaspora Community Services, please go to diaspora.com org for the and for the lambda fund of haiti go to lambifund.org and of course to learn more about the national black leadership commission on aids check our website at nblca.org you can also look for us on facebook twitter instagram linkedin and youtube the manhattan neighborhood network bring these programs to you to better inform you, the viewer, about the important topics that impact your health and well-being. So please let your family, friends, and neighbors know about this programming. I am C. Virginia Fields. I thank you for joining us and hope you'll tune in next time for In Blackers Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And thank you, my guests, my for pleasure. today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks C. so Virginia. much. Pleasure, pleasure seeing you.